you all. Good afternoon, everyone. Many of you probably saw Protective Life Corporation's announcement this morning as a direct result of the Trump tax cuts. The Alabama-based company is raising their minimum wage to $15 per hour and giving a $1,000 bonus to over 2,000 of their workers. For those of you keeping track, we now have over 350 companies that have announced wage increases, bonuses, new hiring, or increased retirement benefits as a direct result of tax reform, which not a single Democrat supported. These announcements have affected over 4 million American workers. The President is working to build an economy that works for all Americans. The tax cuts and reforms are a big part of that, and so is infrastructure. As you all saw yesterday, the President unveiled a legislative outline for rebuilding infrastructure in America. To cure decades of neglect, we are committed to quickly building a safe, reliable, and modern infrastructure to meet the needs of the American people and to fuel economic growth. And to help make this possible, we have a very special announcement today. In keeping with his campaign pledge, the President donates his salary on a quarterly basis to further work being done on important projects. Most recently, the President donated his third quarter salary to help the Department of Health and Human Services combat the opioid epidemic. Prior to that, he donated to the Department of Education and the National Park Service. And today, the President is proud to donate his fourth quarter salary, 2017 salary, to the Department of Transportation to support their programs to rebuild and modernize our crumbling infrastructure. Secretary of Transportation Elaine Chow is here to accept the check. I'd like to bring her up to say a few words, take a couple of questions on infrastructure and about how these funds will be used. And uh, I trust that you'll stay on topic, and then I'll be back up afterwards to answer your questions on the news of the day. That, Secretary Chow, thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you. We'll have to get this check here and with all of us. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I'm accompanied here, in case you were wondering, by two officials of the U.S. Department of Transportation. I have with me Derek Kahn, Undersecretary of Policy, and Jim Ray, the Senior Advisor to the Secretary for Infrastructure. They're here because of this gift, and so let me proceed. As many of you have heard yesterday, 12 federal agencies have been working with the White House on the comprehensive infrastructure proposal that the President announced yesterday. Transportation is one component. The proposal also includes energy, drinking and wastewater, broadband, and veterans' hospitals as well. The goal of the President's proposal is to stimulate at least $1.5 trillion in infrastructure investment which includes a minimum of $200 billion in direct federal funding. And a key element is to empower decision-making at the state and the local level because state and local officials know best the infrastructure needs of their communities. Many of you know that uh, the principles are behind this, and so I wanted to reiterate some of the principles. The principles behind this proposal are, one, to use federal dollars as seed money to encourage infrastructure investment by the states, localities, and the private sector. Two, provide for the infrastructure needs of rural communities. Three, streamline project delivery. And four, invest in transformative projects that benefit everyone. We are already applying these principles to the Department of Transportation's major existing infrastructure grant programs, including, for example, the INFRA grants. And that is why these two gentlemen to my right are here, because their offices will be among those at the Department of Transportation that will be taking the applications and also administering these INFRA grants. This quarter, as mentioned, the President has generously decided to donate his annual salary to the Department's infra grant programs. Infra directly reflects the President's proposal by providing dedicated, discretionary funding for projects that address critical issues facing our nation's highways and bridges and ports. 
under the INFA program, states and localities that secure some funding or financing of their own are given higher priority access to federal funds. In addition, INFRA also reserves at least 25% of its funding to be awarded to rural projects. So infrastructure is the backbone of our economy and it's key to keeping our country competitive. The President's proposal will create new jobs, strengthen our economy, and improve the quality of life for everyone. And so with that quick summary, I'll be more than glad to answer any questions. Yes, John. Uh, Madam Secretary, uh, some of the criticisms of the President's plan as outlined yesterday are that it puts too much of a burden on the states uh, financially because the federal portion is about 13 percent of the overall and might also end up in people paying more taxes, more tolls, that sort of thing. What do you say to that? You know, federal money is not free. Federal money comes from our communities, people, taxpayers in our communities. They take that money, send it to Washington, and then we decide how to use it and send it back to the communities with a lot of strings attached on what they need to do. So what we are trying to do is to recognize the states and localities, communities understand best what their infrastructure needs are and to allow them to have much greater flexibility to decide their own projects in conjunction and in partnership with the federal government. Yes, sir. Okay, Secretary Chow, Secretary Chow um, one other criticism about the President's plan is that it doesn't include addressing the Highway Trust Fund, which uh, yeah. only has so many years ahead of it, uh, of funding uh, just a few years. Uh, if you could address why that was not included in the President's broader infrastructure plan, and then uh, what does the administration plan to do about that very important source of funding for uh, infrastructure projects across the country? Well, the Highway Trust Fund does need to be addressed because every year more money goes out of it than receipts are received. And this will be a huge problem in 2021. So we, in conjunction with the Congress, have got to address this issue. So we're not in any disagreement about that. And the issue is how. And we look forward to consulting with Congress on how to do that. Because again, the cliff begins in 2021. So there are no, no plans. So the White House doesn't have a proposal right now for that. Well, we want to. We don't want to do it unilaterally. As mentioned, the president's proposal consisted of principles, and we want to discuss and work in consultation on a bipartisan basis with the Hill to address the infrastructure needs of our country. Madam Secretary. Madam Secretary. Yes. Um, thank you. The crumbling infrastructure, could you talk to us about, we know what's going on uh, with, with roads, bridges, highways, what have you, but when it comes to rural America, can you yes. give us specific, specifics about what's crumbling, what needs to be fixed, and, and what jobs will be given where? Well, I come from the state of Kentucky. I'm a proud Kentuckian, and I come from a, a rural state, so I am especially concerned about the needs of rural America, and we recognize that the needs of rural America are special. And that is why in the President's proposal, there is actually a provision which addresses the unique uh, needs of rural America. So it will be separate from the, uh, there's a separate title that is addressed to rural America. And similarly, there's a separate title addressed to transformative technology as well. So for example, Derek Kahn, the Undersecretary of Policy, uh, uh, one of his portfolio areas is uh, transformational technology, uh, autonomous vehicles, automated uh, driving systems. So that is another part of the President's uh, infrastructure proposal that uh, we will be also uh, discussing with the Hill. Let's take one last question. Madam Secretary, thank you. Yes. Thank you, Secretary Chell. As you know, the federal gas tax has remained at 184 Cents per gallon since 1993, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has advocated an increase yeah. in the gas tax of 25 cents per gallon. The truckers, the American Trucking Associations, uh, recommended a 20 cent uh, per gallon increase in the gas tax. What's your view on this subject? Well, the president uh, has not declared anything out of bounds. So everything is on the table. The gas tax like many of the other pay-fors that are being discussed, is not ideal. There are pros and cons. The gas tax 
has uh, adverse impact, a very regressive impact on the most vulnerable within our society. Uh, those who depend uh, on jobs, uh, who are hourly workers. So these are tough decisions, which is why, once again, we need to start the dialogue with the Congress and so that we can address these issues on um, this very important uh, point. Could, could you just clarify your, your answer to John from the first question? Uh, were you saying that there, is a, there are strings to attach, so are you saying that taxes will increase and that tolls may increase or they won't? That is a decision that is up to the state and local governments. And also, it's going to depend, uh, you know, that gentleman mentioned about federal gas taxes. These are tough decisions. We all want better infrastructure. But unfortunately, there's just not enough money in the world to pay for all the infrastructure, which is why the president's infrastructure also emphasizes the private sector. Private sector pension funds are a tremendous source of capital for funding public infrastructure. Uh, there are states uh, which disallow the private sector from investing in public infrastructure. So we hope that, that those restrictions can be removed. And then for those states and localities that want to work with the private sector, it's their decision as to whether they want to use private activity bonds, whether they want to use tolls, whatever. What we are saying in this proposal is that we're looking for creative ways for financing. And, and so tolls is one way we're not advocating for them. We're also not endorsing them. It is really up to the local entities that are involved in trying to raise the, fi the financing. As a quick follow-up, you're from Kentucky, so you well know the Waterson Expressway when it was widened in Louisville. One of the biggest, uh, one of the things they liked the best about it, there was no tow. Well, and and so in rural areas, it helped people get to where they wanted to go quicker. Here in Washington D.C. area, you have an abundance of tolls, and it cuts <coughs> into people's paychecks. So while you're espousing that you want to help out rural uh, America, isn't that going to impact on won't tolls? hurt rural America? That's really, uh, okay, you're mixing up, I think, several things here. I'm so sorry. Um, there's actually going to be a title, as I mentioned, on rural America. So that is separate from the rest of the titles in this proposal that we're talking about. So there'll be a special section for rural America. And then as for whether other uh, urban areas want to embark upon tolls, or private activity bonds, or um, asset recycling, that is up to them. We are giving them the flexibility to do so. So it's actually, they're getting much greater flexibility now to be able to look at the panoply of creative financing mechanisms and decide for themselves what they want. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm sure we'll be talking more. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Secretary Chow. Uh, due to the fact the President's got an event here momentarily, we'll jump straight into the questions for today. Huh. Not an eager bunch at all. John? Uh, as you know, uh, FBI Director Christopher Wray laid out a different timeline than the White House has been telling us, uh, or one that would seem to be in contradiction to. Uh, the Director said uh, he seemed to indicate that the first that you would have known about this might have been in March, then again in June, then November, then in January when their case was actually closed. Look, um, we explained the process extensively last week. The White House Personnel Security Office, staffed by career officials, received information last year and what they considered to be the final background investigation report in November. But they had not made a final recommendation for adjudication to the White House because the process was still ongoing when Rob Porter resigned. In the view of Personnel Security Office, the FBI's July report required significant additional investigatory fieldwork before Personnel Security Office could begin to evaluate the information for adjudication. As Director Ray said, information was still coming to the White House Personnel Security Office in February. So just to be clear that, in the, the July report, if not back to March, was there information contained in those reports about the allegations about Rob? 
I wouldn't have access to that information. I wouldn't know the answer to that, John. Sarah, Chris, I just want to drill down on one important fact because you and Raj, and you just said this again, that the investigation was ongoing. Christopher Ray said it was closed in January. So who's telling the truth here? Uh, both. As I said, uh, the FBI portion was closed. The White House Personnel Security Office, uh, who is the one that makes a recommendation for adjudication, had not finished their process and therefore not made a recommendation to the White House. And let me just clarify one more point. You said yesterday that you didn't get any paperwork from the FBI. Chris Ray said that he did submit paperwork at all the various moments that were. Again, that would that. come through the White House Personnel Security Office, which had not completed their investigation and not pass that information to but the you White House. that you did receive paperwork. Again, the White House, I think you need to be very clear about there's multiple groups here. Uh, the White House Personnel Security Office, which is staffed by career officials, would have may have received information, uh, and, but they had not completed their process and made a recommendation to the White House for adjudication. Sarah, finally, who's, who allowed John Kelly, or Rob Porter rather, to stay here without permanent security clearance? Uh, I, I can't comment on specifics of that other than what we've already said on that matter. And Sarah, can Cecilia. You answer questions about Sorry, Kristen, I'm going to keep moving because we've got a, a short time fuse here today. Is the White House still maintaining that John Kelly really had no idea about these allegations of domestic abuse until this story broke? I can only give you the best information that I have, and that's my understanding. And does the president believe the women? Uh, again, the president takes uh, all of these accusations very seriously. He believes in due process. Above everything else, he supports the victims of any type of violence uh, and certainly would condemn any violence against anyone. Well, we still haven't heard him say that himself. The cameras were Look, in front of him today. I, I, again, the president dictated to me specifically that comment yesterday, which I read out to you guys. Zeke. Sarah, I think, Sarah, at 2.40, first, uh, can you speak to, did anyone at the White House Personnel Security Office have any communication with anyone in the West Wing about Rob Porter's clearance uh, between when the FBI started submitting its interim reports and, and, and I'm not aware of any communication. And I can't so. say definitively, but I'm not aware of any communication. And then suddenly on Capitol Hill today, in an interview, interview with the Associated Press, the DNI Coates uh, said that those with interim security clearances should not be granted, should have limited access to classified information rather than access to the full gamut that uh, a full clearance would provide. Um, can you speak to whether that is a current practice right now for the large number of, uh, uh, for the significant number of, uh, of, of officials, whether it be the West Wing or the broader White House complex, presidents aides who don't have permanent security clearances, do they, or do they have limited access to classified information? I can't speak to whether people have interim or permanent security clearances at all and therefore can't comment on the process. Uh, we, we are following the process that has been used by uh, previous administrations uh, and we would rely on the law enforcement and intelligence communities to determine if that process needed to be changed. Well, the DNI suggested that it would, would be changed. And so they would be the ones that would make that determination and play a role in what those changes would look like. Sarah, Sarah, Josh. Sarah, you're saying that um, on four different occasions, the FBI obviously said that it, it made the White House aware of the allegations. Uh, and the White House said, official said that until Tuesday night, they did not realize the extent of the allegations. Should someone of the FBI or the Personnel Security Office be punished for not telling White House officials? How can how can those two things be? That's that's something that would be well beyond uh, my scope He's to determine, Josh. Upset, though, that they weren't told if everyone knew, but no one in the senior staff found out. I, I haven't I haven't I haven't asked him about that specifically, Matthew. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, Raj, the other day said last week that the situation could have been handled better. Yesterday, you echoed that said the situation could have been handled better. Today, the chief of staff said it was all done right. Can you explain, did, does the White House think this Rob Porter situation could have been handled differently, or do you guys think this was all done right? As you Look, as I said yesterday, I think every day we come here, we do the very best that we can, and every day we can do better than the day before. But and we're going to continue to try, strive for that. We're, we're uh, humans, making us imperfect people. And so every day I think we can learn from the day before, and we can strive to do better. And that's our goal, certainly, uh, within our team. And we're going to continue to try to do everything we can to help serve the American people to the best of our ability. Was it appropriate for Hope Hicks to be involved in drafting some of these statements, given her relationship with Mr. Uh, she was not part of a lot of the conversations that took place 
Uh, I don't recall any of you being in the room to be able to say specifically what comments she made or didn't make. She's the White House Communications uh, Director and is an important and valuable member of the staff, and she has done a great job in that role. Sarah, Steve? Sarah, was, was there some discussion here about promoting Rob Ford to another job at the time this all blew up? Not that I'm aware of. I, just, I, I don't know the answer to that. Jeff? Sir, you said um, that the FBI, I said it was completed in, in late July, but you said a follow-up required more uh, field work on that. Was that because something that Rob Porter said in response to that, that the allegations weren't true? Or what required more field work follow-up? I wouldn't know the specifics. I can only uh, refer you back to the previous statement. If Julie? I could ask again, though, um, in an op-ed this morning in the Washington, Washington Post, the first wife of, a, of a Rob Porter said specifically of you, I expected a woman to do better. Based on what you know, do you believe you were personally misled, and do you have any regret for how you have explained this to the American people? Uh, look, as I said, we do the very best job we can every single day. I would never presume to understand uh, anything going on with that individual, uh, nor would I uh, think that she could presume uh, what's going on with me or the way that I'm responding. Uh, look, we've condemned domestic violence in every way possible. In fact, the president's budget that he released yesterday fully funds the Violence Against Women Act. We're looking for ways that we can take action to help prevent this from ever happening to anyone. Uh, and to uh, presume that I feel differently is simply a very strong mischaracterization of, of who I am and who this White House is and what our actions are focused on and what we're trying to do here. If I could ask one so, more. Where does John Kelly Jeff. stand as we sit here today in terms of if the president has confidence in him, why does he have confidence in him based on um, everything we've learned over the last week? Uh, look, I don't have anything further to add. The president has confidence in his chief of staff. We're going to continue trying to do the best we can to help the American people. Julie? So a clarification and a question. In July, when the FBI was sent back into the field to get more information, are you telling us that no senior staff, not Don McGahn, not Joe Hagan, not John Kelly, nobody in the senior staff in the West Wing was involved in that decision to tell them to go back and see if they could get more um, information on what Again, was I, I can only, not that I'm aware of, I can't say with 100% certainty, but uh, not that I'm aware of, of any conversations uh, okay. between you, those individuals. Are you looking at now ways that you could change the process so that if a senior official in the White House is facing credible allegations of spousal abuse or some other criminal charge, that senior staff would be notified in a more timely way? I mean, this appears to have, if your timeline is accurate, taken more than a year. Look, uh, again, I think that this is a process that uh, the law enforcement and intelligence community should weigh in on and determine if changes should be made to the way that it's carried out. I'm not talking about their process. I'm talking about the process here where an investigation where serious allegations could surface and that nobody in the West Wing would be aware of that. But that would include those uh, agencies and those departments, so you couldn't exclude them from a conversation about what changes uh, should and need to be made to any program. I think that that would have to be uh, something that involved all of the stakeholders and something certainly uh, far beyond my purview to, to walk you through today. Sarah, so. uh, just following up on what Julie was asking, you're saying that law enforcement should weigh in, but you're the White House. You're in charge, uh, and this is your process. Should you not weigh in? It's actually not our process. A, lot, a large number of the background component is run by the FBI. Other intelligence agencies weigh in. Again, what I said is that all of the stakeholders should be part of that discussion, and it should be looked at and determined whether or not changes need to be made to the process. Uh, uh, given that it, Im it impacts the White House staff, do you not want to request uh, an improved process here? Again, that would go beyond my scope that I can walk you through here today, but I think it's certainly a conversation that all of those stakeholders should have. April. Sarah, a couple questions. Um, in light of everything that's going on, is there a review now, an internal review of all of those who have interim security clearances to see if they should stay or should they go? I can't speak about uh, whether or not different staff have interim or permanent security clearances. I'm asking, staff, I I'm asking you about the process. All right. Is there a review of those who have interim passes to see if they're going to stay or they're going to go? Because in light of what's happening now. Yeah, my understanding is that has been ongoing for a while, um, and that determination would be made outside of anything I can walk you through at and this you, point. And you spoke of um, fully funding the Violence Against Women Act. Uh, it's up for reauthorization. Tell me the price, um, how much the president is trying to put in that, and was that the price prior to all of this that's happened with these two people in the last week? 
I, I'm sorry, I'm not following your question. The budget. You, you're saying the president's going to fully fund uh, the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act. It's up in March. Um, how much? What is he putting in his budget? I'd have to look at the specific number, but it was rolled out in the budget that was presented you yesterday. You mentioned it, but is the number the number that's always been, or did was it just done? What have can you talk to us about? The I know is what that was. What was requested has been. Uh, put into the president's budget. Was it, put in? uh, it was in the budget that was rolled out yesterday that's been part of the ongoing process. Well, we, we, just we don't write budget. a budget like in 20 minutes, so it's been part of something that's I been ongoing. That. I understand that. I understand that. But there's some things in that budget Mr. Mulvaney did not tell us about yesterday. That means you probably didn't ask those questions. Oh, I'm going to keep going. Yeah, John, go ahead. He didn't give us that answer. Thanks he purposely didn't give us that information. Thanks a lot, Sarah. I, I wanted to just get some clarification from you regarding the testimony, the sworn testimony today by the FBI director laid out the timeline and according to the FBI director's testimony, the FBI submitted a partial report on the investigation in question of uh, Porter's uh, background check in March and then a completed background investigation in late July. And yesterday when I was asking you about when the White House counsel uh, learned about Mr. Porter had he learned before uh, the report in the Daily Mail last week, your reply to me was the process for the background was ongoing and the White House had not received any specific papers regarding the completion of that background check. So those two statements, Mr. Uh, the FBI Director's statement, Mr. Ray, and your statement yesterday seem to be at odds with one another. Do you see anything that you'd like to clarify in terms of what I asked you? Uh, today based upon your answer yesterday? Yeah, as I said earlier, my understanding uh, is any information would have gone to the uh, personnel security office. That office had not completed their process in order to make a recommendation for adjudication to the White House. That was still ongoing and therefore a recommendation had not been made. You said the specific papers regarding the completion of the background check had not been received. That's part of that process that the White House Personnel Security Office plays, uh, run by career officials, and we hadn't received a recommendation from that office. Yet the FBI director said today under oath that the completed background investigation was actually submitted in late July. So which one is it? Uh, as I, let me read this to you again. The White House Personnel Security Office, staffed by career officials, received information last year in what they considered to be the final background investigation report in November, but they had not made a final recommendation for adjudication to the White House because the process was still ongoing when Porter resigned. In the view of Personnel Security Office, the FBI's July report required significant additional investig investigatory fieldwork before Personnel Security Office could begin to evaluate the information for adjudication. Uh, we find those statements to be consistent with one another. Jack, Mr. Yeah. McGann, oh, come sorry, out John, here and answer any questions that we may have regarding what he knew and when he knew Sir, it. Sir, you said repeatedly that um, you and the press team did the very best job you can to relay whatever information you know up there. Uh, so is there a feeling that Chief of Staff John Kelly has misled you and his colleagues on what he knew and when um, to, and set up the communication staff for failure to rely credible information to us over the past week in order to cover up the way that he handled the firing of Rob Porter? No, we're simply stating that we're giving you the best information that we're going to have. Obviously, the press team's not going to be as read in maybe as some el other elements at a given moment on a variety of topics, but we relay uh, the best and most accurate information that we have, and we get those from those individuals. Can you, just talk about the other, can you just talk about the other staffers who have been dismissed um, previously for not passing background checks and why Porter wasn't treated in a similarly timely uh, My moment. understanding is the same process was followed for all employees, and it's the same process that was used in previous administrations, and I, I can't comment comment on anybody else's dismissal. To live. Thank you, Sarah. You've talked <coughs> multiple times about sort of wanting to get, get us the best information that you have. This scandal has been going on for a week now, and we still don't have answers to the basic questions of sort of who knew what when, whether General I've, I've done knew. the best I can to walk you through that process, as has Raj. We've done that pretty extensively, and I'd refer you back to all of the statements we've so given I'm on that. I'm going to ask you whether you've spoken specifically to General John Kelly and to the White House Counsel to ask them these questions, because you said, I'm not aware or I'm not sure. I have, and this is the information that was given to me by those individuals. Yeah, on a quarter question. Uh, House Speaker uh, Paul Ryan this morning on the uh, Fox Business Network said, we've got to get out on entitlements. He talked about a structural deficit, probably said, we need to get 
our other partners in government, the White House included, to be willing to do the kind of entitlement reform that we're willing to do in the House. Um, what does the President disagree with House Speaker Paul Ryan on that question of the structural deficit and the, and the problem of mandatory spending? I would have to ask him specifically on that question. I know uh, the president certainly would like to reduce the deficit, and it's one of the reasons that his budget uh, this time, uh, this budget reduced the deficit by $3 trillion, uh, which is one of the largest in history, and he's going to continue to look for ways to do says, that. The speaker says that it's the structural deficit for mandatory spending, not, not the discretionary spending that is the driver. He's been saying this for years. Does the, was the president disagree with him. I, I know he said he doesn't agree with uh, that approach to entitlements. Why does he not agree with that assessment? I'd have to ask the him what the specifics are that he doesn't agree with him on. Dave, we'll make this the last question. Uh, Majority Leader McConnell said today that the DACA negotiations have to be done by the end of this week. Did he give the White House a head up on that decision? And does that reflect any view from the White House that Democrats are not bargaining in good faith? Uh, for example, they didn't, they blocked a vote on sanctuary cities today. Uh, look, it's up to Congress to set the timeline. The President has laid out the priorities that he has for that legislation, and we're only going to support a legislation that deals with those four priorities that we've laid out. We hope Republicans and Democrats can come together uh, to a consensus to fix that problem and not kick the can down the road. Thanks, guys. Will John Kelly come out and answer some of these questions, Is the President Sarah? afraid to come out and talk? Talk to us in this press room. Hi there and welcome to The Briefing Room. It's day eight of Rob Porter Gate. I'm ABC News political director Rick Klein, joined by Mary Alice Parks from our political team, John Ibrahovic, also from the little team, and a special guest today, Pierre Thomas, our senior justice department uh, correspondent. And uh, Pierre, I want to start with you because the focus today really was the a pretty explosive testimony this morning by Christopher Ray, the director of the FBI. We've heard from the White House that uh, the background check on Rob Porter had not been completed. Chris Ray had something very different to say today about that in particular. He made clear that the FBI completed its investigation some time ago and passed that information along to uh, various components of the White House, and that basically it was their call as to what happened next. And in, for the White House to then say, as you heard from Sarah Sanders earlier, these were career officials, the personnel security office. These are White House officials we're talking about. This was out of the FBI's hands entirely, right? Exactly. In, in terms of the final dispensation of terms of the exact security clearance, that would be a White House call. But clearly the FBI had turned up this evidence of domestic violence and passed it along to the White House. And the key question is, what did White House officials do once they got that information? And they don't have a good answer for either possibility. Either they didn't ask questions, they didn't mind the fact that he didn't have a security clearance, they didn't follow up, which looks bad, or they did know exactly why he didn't have a security clearance and they covered it up. And she doesn't have a good answer, and those right. look like the only two possibilities. The answer is essentially this was a clerical error. Mm -hmm. This went to one office, and you know that office made a determination, and you know that information went somewhere. But at the end of the day, you know this this. The fact that it's been eight days and the White House is still having to answer questions on this is, is very telling about how they responded to it. Pierre, this isn't the first time that Chris Ray has tangled with the White House. In fact, he was asked about the, the memo uh, in today's testimony as well. Uh, did Chris Ray know what he was doing there today in defending the Bureau, defending his own agents out of any efforts from the White House to deflect responsibility? This is a, a bit different than the memo uh, issue where uh, he did something extremely unusual put out a statement on a day when no one was calling for a statement and basically said they had grave concerns about the release of the memo. He was drawing a line in the sand in terms of his own independence from this White House because he knew the president wanted uh, this memo to come out. Uh, today he's at a hearing, uh, he's asked a question, and I saw it, him as clarifying exactly what the, the Bureau did and didn't do and letting it sit simply as that. Yeah, that clarity, of course, uncomfortable for the White House to deal with. The other big headline out of today's hearing was uh, was about Russia's role. But it's the big story that this is all connected to and all of the Mueller investigation and everything else, Pierre. But the idea that, uh, that all of the nation's top intelligence officials were saying the same thing today happens to be something that the president himself is not saying. Rick, I think the most stark thing about today's hearing was this clarion call from all the top intelligence mm -hmm. officials that 2018, the upcoming mm -hmm. midterm elections, are at risk for the Russians to try to do something to uh, impact democracy in our country. Uh, we had 
every official say that over and over again. You had CIA Director uh, Pompeo say that there's evidence that the Russians are trying right now to target 2018. Already. Yeah. What, what I'm struck by is the fact that if you had all those intelligence agents talking about a physical threat, saying that they believe Russians are planning to bring bombs or guns or something really visceral and tangible and physical like that, you would imagine a unified country. You would imagine people coming together across the aisle to develop a plan, fear, and wanting to unite sort of hand in hand like you do in a time of war. And in fact, we now have the opposite. So often when we talk to voters, they are more divided on this issue. Some just flat out don't believe it, aren't listening to intelligence officials. And it feels like this is an issue driving a wedge in the country, not bringing people together. Right. Well, here's where the politics play out today. You had the Democrats making the case forcefully that they want to see the president speak out forcefully on this issue and make for an interagency attack on what's coming. They want to hear more from the president and they feel that because of his concerns about uh, the ongoing Mueller probe, the special counsel probe, that he's not doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, Republicans today pointed to the fact that they think that while this is an issue, one uh, of the senators talked about the fact that he thinks that Americans are becoming more aware of this social media threat, in particular from the Russians. But I, again, when you have officials that senior all stating that the upcoming election in 2018 and 2020 are at risk for the Russians to do meddling, and at one point, um, Director of the National Intelligence uh, Division, uh, Director Coates, said, straight up, he said, I don't want some Russian telling us how to vote. Mm -hmm. And he said that's exactly what they're contending would possibly happen. Wow. Yeah. And I, I mean, we're sort of used to, to the president sort of playing this issue, very a little, little coy about it. We're used to not hearing uh, him speak very forcefully about it. But I don't think that we should still just take that as normal because this is something that's going to be an ongoing issue. It's clearly going to come up this year. So. And in both of these topics that we're talking about, it's something the president isn't saying. It's other people, even on, in the White House staff or in right. the administration, are, are very clear in saying, yes, the Russians are, are, are trying to hack us. Yes, uh, this was a bad thing. And I, supporting, supporting the victims of domestic violence. In both cases, the president not uttering those words himself. And, and Rick, one other quick, quick point. Look, we're not talking about 2016 now. Right. We're talking about an upcoming election in which millions of Americans are going to go out and vote and determine who's in control of the House and who's in control of the right. Senate. And the notion that a foreign power is looming out there potentially to play a role in that election is really stunning. And it really is. All right, Pierre, thank you for being here on The Briefing Room. I'll get back to your work for World News tonight. We look yes, forward sir. to your report uh, in, in a little bit. Uh, I want to turn to Ali Rogan on Capitol Hill because uh, one other thing we heard from the White House today from the president at the start of the day is this DACA deadline, he says it's for real. It's March 5th. Of course, that isn't exactly the way it works in terms of a deadline. But are people on Capitol Hill, is this given any kind of renewed optimism or pessimism around the immigration debate that's now going on in the Senate? started in earnest today in the Senate, but it got off to a bit of a rocky start because there was a bit of a disagreement between the two leaders, McConnell and Schumer, over which bill to begin voting on. As uh, we've been talking about, this is an open process where senators are just going to bring their proposals to the floor and see if they get enough votes to add it to the ultimate bill. But they couldn't agree on which bill to actually start voting on, so that doesn't bode well for the notion that they can get to an agreement on, on what to uh, vote and get in an underlying bill. Uh, the big question now, though, Rick, is, is this debate going to proceed past this week? We're already halfway through Tuesday, and the Senate usually doesn't stick around on Fridays. So we're only really looking like we have another two days left to debate this. And Leader McConnell is saying that after this week, he is prepared and poised to move on because, as he says, we have other things to do. We don't exactly know what those other things are, Rick. And as you mentioned, that March 5th deadline is certainly creeping up. We should know that we heard at the top of the briefing today from Mitch McConnell's wife, Elaine Chow, the Secretary of Transportation, and some other things in terms of infrastructure. Uh, but, but Mary Alice, the, the, the deadlines being set here by McConnell and also by the president, what's your sense? I mean, th these, are, these are issues that have taken decades to build up. There's been no sense of any kind of a breakthrough. But people on the Hill felt good about going into this week, so it's hard to imagine that everything falls apart. We saw lawmakers on both sides of the aisle in the Senate feel confident that they would get something through with 60 votes. So I'm not quite ready to give up on the process. Um, I was surprised at how many Democrats were even optimistic. Uh, they, they were banking on this week and they had a lot riding on this week. So I think it's still possible, but Ali's right to point out all of the uh, tough variables. Right, and I think it's important to realize that, that throughout all the negotiations on this issue, 
Immigration was one of Donald Trump's key campaign issues in 2016. He has his things that he wants. He wants the wall. He wants you know an end to some of these different policies. And at the end of the day, I mean, he really still is a wild card, no matter what happens on the Hill. Why okay, three guys, weeks for these 800,000 or so dreamers? Can I point something out here? What's interesting is that among the proposals that are being circulated that McConnell and Schumer have debated bringing to the floor, um, they're actually, in a lot of ways, they're quite similar. Um, they both contain funding for a border wall. They both talk about a pathway to citizenship for dreamers. The big differences are actually on these sort of fringe, not fringe, but not the big issues, the ones we don't talk about as much. Um, the visa diversity, diversity lottery, where do those visas go? The issue of family-based migration, cutting down an immigrant's ability to bring in other family members. So it seems like actually the big differences are on the margins so that once they actually begin voting on these things, they might agree to the big stuff. It's the small stuff that's really going to potentially trip this up or extend the debate. Well, and so the White House will have to decide if they're willing to cave right. on some of those well, pillars if they get two pillars passed. Right. Let's ask Stephen Miller what he thinks about the yeah. small stuff in, yep. in that case. Uh, Ali, we want to talk to, talk to toss to some of your reporting from today because a pretty extraordinary scene playing out on Capitol Hill. Uh, I a, like the video. A, the it is, it is, it is so fun. Great. We're going to have some fun with it. But the backstory, of course, is that Bob Corker, the senator from Tennessee, announced earlier, uh, or announced last year that he wouldn't run for another term. Uh, a lot of reports out there that he's reconsidering. You try to get him to answer some questions. Let's take a look. Senator Corker, are you going to be running for re-election? I don't really want to talk about this. Thank you, man. Senator, are you reconsidering running for re-election? I don't have anything to talk about today. Thank you. That's all. not a no. Senator, yeah, can I try one more time? Are you Senator? having conversations about running again? I'm just having conversations about my job here. You can talk about your job all you want, but it's it, a lot it, of non-denial. So, so Al, Ali has a long history and solid track record of chasing down those senators, and I think you would agree with me that there's a difference between when they say nothing and they turn their back and they don't engage at all, or when they flirt with the camera. He knew exactly <laughs> what he was doing. He heard your question. He sort of answered it in part. I'm having conversation about my job. He knows he is keeping this conversation going. Yeah, it's what we call a non-denial denial, right? He's, <laughs> he's dancing around the question. He's not giving us an outright yes or no, and he's definitely keeping his options open. So right. while I can't say based on his answers to us that yes, he is actually looking at running again and not retiring, it certainly strikes me as something that he might be uh, throwing around. And guys, you know who's acting like it's serious are Marsha Blackburn, oh, who's, yeah. uh, who's running for this seat and is yep. announced candidate. And all these the conservative seat. PACs that are backing and her. And these totally. groups are freaked They're out by this her. prospect. They're sticking with her, and they are being absolutely harsh in their condemnation of the incumbent senator from Tennessee. Absolutely. And I know our colleague Kristen Otto is doing some really interesting reporting on this race. And the statement out from Blackburn's campaign today, anyone who thinks Marsha Blackburn can't win a general election is just a plain sexist pig. I mean, wow. look. A lot of subtlety there. Yeah. Right. I, this is going to And into the Koch network told me that they right. were doubling down on their support of her, that they feel like Tennessee would benefit from her as their Senate, having her as their senator. But I think that there's a lot to read between the lines here. Is, is Corker contemplating getting back in this race because he thinks Republicans could really lose this seat? Right. Remember, Democrats have a top tier candidate, a former governor himself, running for that seat. So is Corker worried about his party losing that seat, maybe losing the majority altogether? Or is it the opposite? Does he feel like you were saying that that it's just more favorable for him, that he doesn't mind the tone as much anymore? Well, interesting to, to see the first time that President Trump weighs in on this. Sarah yep. Sanders asked about it yesterday. She took a pass. We'll see if the president tweets something yep. on any of this. All right, Ali, uh, let's wrap things up here. Any final thoughts from you today from Capitol Hill? Well, it's 3.0 of infrastructure week, right? And I would say that <laughs> That stuff landed with a bit of a thud here on Capitol Hill. And again, today we heard from uh, the Senate leadership for the first time and the only time all week that they're going to be holding press availabilities. Neither of them were asked anything to my, uh, my recollection about infrastructure. So the conversation here is still about DACA and it's also about Rob Porter and what to do with the White House clearance uh, process. So in the, in the sense that uh, this infrastructure proposal sort of fell with a thud, uh, I would say that I don't know when the next time members of Congress are really going to bring it back up again. Week four. We'll see when that comes. Johnny, what yeah. did you learn today? Well, I'm going to go outside the Beltway, and I'm going to talk about uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, there's a key deadline midnight on Thursday. If you're up at midnight on Thursday, <laughs> there's a battle going on over redrawing the congressional district in Pennsylvania, which could have major impact on the balance of power in the United States House. Democrats are talking about picking up two or three seats there. but. The Republicans and, and the Democratic governor are having a tough time figuring out the map thus far. Mary Alice? 
I was struck by the fact that Sarah Sanders continued to not only deflect blame, but not express any upset or outrage that there was uh, someone working on her staff accused of domestic violence who was kept from getting a security clearance and she didn't know. If you would imagine that she would seem upset about that or talk like she was regretful about that fact and there was none of that expressed. And I learned that taking on the FBI is a dangerous business. Chris Ray did exactly what he's that? supposed to do up there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he, he, he just answered the questions, but he knew exactly yeah. what he was doing with those answers. And he knew that it was undercutting the White House's line. It makes it an untenable position for the White House to now be blaming some bureaucrats inside the White House when this information on Rob Porter was sitting there in that building, whether or not anyone acted on it. I mean, he wanted to defend, he wanted to defend his team, yeah. his department. And I think we've seen that time and time again from Chris Ray. Exactly. All right, that does it for this edition of the briefing room. Thank you to Ali Rogan. Thanks to Pierre Thomas for joining us earlier. For Johnny Verhovic and Mary Alice Parks, I'm Rick Klein. Please download the ABC News app and we will catch you next time right here on The Briefing Room.